I mean, we've had Half-Life 3 started a couple of times. What you've just heard was said by Gabe Newell in a closed video conference in October of 2020, a year after the announcement of Half-Life Alex. According to the developers, all of the attempts to create the third Half-Life have ended with an understanding that Source 2 as an engine was just not ready for a full-fledged sequel. And then every time devs reach a dead end, fall into a depression, and sooner or later they split ways. Some wanted to use the solutions of other studios, such as Unreal Engine or Unity, and then just continue making games, while others wanted to finish the engine and only then return to their old work. The release of Half-Life Alex showed us the real picture. Ten years after the announcement of Source 2, the engine lacked many necessary technologies and tools, while the public got only a stripped-down version of Hammer to create levels and then SFM to create animations. Half-Life Alex was a necessary push, kind of a test with a goal to create a full-fledged game in the state of the engine in which it was for a long time. The successful release untied their hands and instead of maintaining the Half-Life Alex branch, they've put all their efforts into further improvements and preparation for the release of future games. The forced push of CSGO to a new engine and the beginning of Deadlock's development cycle added missing pieces to the puzzle. The engine was finally ready to release first and third person shooters. We'll continue in a moment, but while you have time, check out Skins Monkey. Use code GABEN and get up to a $5 bonus. Select a few of your current skins, pick a new one in the same price range, and exchange your old and ugly CSGO items to something new and shiny from Counter-Strike 2. Use code GABEN and buy skins much cheaper with a 30 plus 5% top-up bonus. The first mention of a suspicious project called HLX appeared on March 26, 2021 in a Dota 2 update. It is important to note that HLX existed next to HLVR, also known as Half-Life Alex, which confirms the words of Robin Walker, who stated that HLA is a starting point for the development of the next Half-Life game. Just as the spin-off built around Alex used a huge number of assets and developments from previous iterations of Half-Life 3, HLX is likewise based on the same foundation. Over the course of the next three years, we regularly see leaks of some games set in the Half-Life universe. Previously, it was quite difficult to determine which particular game was it, since initially Deadlock, aka Shadowline, aka Neon Prime, and aka Citadel took place during the Seven Hour War, where the Combine fought against the Rebels on the streets of City 17. We will talk about this in a separate video, however, when first pieces of information about Deadlock started appearing, it became very clear that a huge chunk of previous leaks were never related to any new IP. Thus, we can now clearly understand what the developers are actually preparing for HLX. In 2021, I was able to talk with a person who had access to a huge amount of internal information. It is important to note that I regularly receive emails from alleged Valve insiders, but each person like that should be approached with extreme caution and be triple-checked to clarify every piece of information. Sometimes something could look trustful, something could sound like absolute nonsense, but when several independent sources' information overlap, you can trust them just a tiny little bit more. It was the same kind of situation that led me to releasing a certain video at the very end of 2022, almost two years ago. For those who for whatever reason haven't seen it, I've described quite accurately what Neon Prime is, when the port of CSGO to Source 2 will be released and what Half-Life X is supposed to be. I'll quote a small portion from that video. HLX is a direct continuation of Half-Life Alex and chronologically takes the role of Half-Life 3. Initially, the game was designed for VR headsets, but later on switched to ordinary flat monitors. Development began shortly before the announcement of Half-Life Alex during the time period when the cliffhanger ending was still being written down, which retconned the ending of Episode 2. Let's start with the strangest thing yet. For several years, few of the Valve developers' portfolios were mentioning work on a certain ambitious, previously unseen gameplay for an unannounced project, which includes various locations, lighting improvements, combat encounters with improved AI, player mechanics, and puzzles. After the appearance of Deadlock, it became very clear that there is really no special kind of combat between NPCs or any kind of puzzles in that game either. Therefore, it was obvious that it was related to a different project. Nevertheless, I want to note that the early version of Deadlock was a multiplayer game set in the Half-Life universe, and potentially everything said further may be remnants of that old version. Furthermore, quite recently, in another portfolio of a voice actor who's worked on a large number of AAA games, there was a mention of participating in a certain Valve project called White Sands. 
We'll leave the theories about that for a separate video, but it is worth noting that White Forest is quite important in the history of Gordon and Alex. The most obvious finds indicate that in the next single-player Half-Life, we would play as someone holding a gravity gun and wearing an HEV suit. HEV suit, plug detach. A string specifying that the character wearing the suit will be able to attach and detach from somewhere or something. Most likely, this is related to Half-Life Health Stations. A similar VR mechanic has already been made for a game called Vertigo, the author of which helped Valve in the development of Half-Life Alex. Interestingly enough, in a recent Dota 2 update, the line was renamed to Burbank Suit Plug Detach, and either the developers are trying to hide the obvious mention, or the player will wear a prototype of a newer suit. Gravity played a huge role in previous Half-Life games, and of course there are a lot of mentions of a gravity gun interacting with objects, maximum and minimum power, settings that allow or prohibit moving objects using gravity, as well as priorities and ignoring the mass and size of objects. But apparently, in HLX, gravity will be much more important and will affect the entire environment. Valve has already experimented with similar concepts at the end of Half-Life. Alex, however, we have something completely new on our hands now. Parameters related to changing the gravity and orientation of objects in space. Lines related to the creation of levels and AI navigation in conditions of altered gravity. The developers are clearly paying attention to the creation of levels where gravity will play an important role and adapting the AI to to these conditions, which opens up new opportunities for puzzles and combat. I will assume that in this game we'll see a completely new technology that allows you to manipulate gravity at this capacity. Next comes information about creatures from Zen. If you didn't know, in the Half-Life universe, this world is a place where all sorts of monsters and other weird entities reside. It is valid to point out that developers themselves have repeatedly said in various interviews that they had to cut out a good number of creatures from HLA, as interacting with them in VR was too scary for players. NPC Hound Eye Item Attach the ability to attach some items to NPC creatures. In this case, these are multi-eyed dogs from the first game. But interestingly, in the same Dota update, this string was renamed to NPC Monster Item Attach. Zen Gorilla Retreat Spot, a hint for controlling the behavior of a Zen Gorilla, indicating a place where it should retreat. Interestingly, one of the lines mentions some kind of gorilla tentacle. The existence of zombie gorillas was hinted at in Half-Life Alex as a joke when you pass by an animal statue in the zoo. Zen Jellyfish Food and Zen Jellyfish Reach Hints related to a behavior of Zen Jellyfish for finding food and possibly attacking the player. The game model of this creature already lies in the files of Half-Life Alex. however, it did not particularly appear in the game itself. Zen Swooper Circling Center, Zen Swooper Food, and Zen Swooper Landing Spot also hints for controlling flight and behavior. Most likely, we are supposed to see these flying birdies in Zen. Of course, hints for headcrabs, for burying in the ground and jumping out of rocket capsules which the Combine infected Ravenholm with. Small mentions of antlions and zombies. There are also strange mentions of some ordinary and frozen blob. Judging by the files of Half-Life Alex, these are some strange farting plants. And, to my great surprise, there was a mention of the Blobulator. For those who suddenly do not know, this is a cut NPC from Half-Life 2, which was firstly completely cancelled, then was decided to be used in the third episode, and after the third episode did not come out, it was reused as a base for the gels in Portal 2. According to community findings, this is a friendly, immortal NPC who is hostile to combine and as an attack envelops the enemy, additionally is able to climb walls. Next will be lines related to the combine behavior as well as other NPCs. Some of them may be leftovers from the development of Citadel. Hints for controlling the behavior of the combine indicating places for them to retreat, use shields, give signals, or take sniper positions. Installing mines and disabling them in certain areas. The ability to control NPCs including giving them abilities and items as well as being able to activate them. Lines describing various aspects of NPC behavior, including decision-making logic, inflicting damage, reacting to sounds, and executing script commands. Sound flags to control the environment only for allies, only for the Combine, and on reacting to threats. A huge behavior system and moods for non-playable characters. The type of mood that can be assigned to an NPC. Animations that will be played depending on the current mood. Mood can affect the animations of both the entire body of the NPC and its head, which allows you to create more expressive and emotional reactions. 
creating conditions that change the mood of the NPC. Parameters control the time intervals associated with the playback of mood animations. Regulation of the intensity of mood animations. Activation of certain mood animations when the NPC is listening or speaking. Both variables indicate that they can be in a state of active listening, which may be related to the reaction to the speech of the player or other characters. And the fact that NPCs can be in a state of conversation, perhaps responding to player or initiating dialogues. Mentions of a new technology for procedural animation of speech and sounds that come from mouth. It's called Speech Graphics and has this icon in the tools. First Google result gives us a related site with a suspiciously similar logo. There once was a ship that put to sea, the name of the ship was the Billy of Tea. The winds blew up her bow, dip down, oh blow my bully boys blow, ha! So speech Graphics RTS will allow the creation of more natural and expressive speech animations for characters. In a nutshell, they provide a solution by integrating which the facial expressions of the characters will repeat the received sounds one to one. A clear application of these developments can be seen in the recent Hogwarts Legacy and many other games. And for the first time since forever, they've updated their tool called Face Poser, which once again refers to speech of NPCs and the change of mood depending on certain circumstances, controlling the direction of the character's eyes, indicating to him the target to look at. New Hair System Three suspicious materials related to hair have appeared in the engine, but they don't have the necessary textures and shaders yet. In Half-Life Alex, all hair materials use the standard VR complex VFX shader. So apparently the developers from Valve are working on a separate PBR, possibly filament shader and hair materials for games on Source 2. Most likely the CS postfix means compute shader, which means that the calculations of this shader are performed on the GPU for better optimization. Based on this, hair process a material associated with complex mathematical calculations such as dynamic hair simulation, their physical interaction with the character and the environment during the player movement or under the influence of wind or certain other situations. Hair Render Volume A material associated with volumetric rendering to simulate thousands of individual hairs simultaneously without additional performance costs. Hair shading, a material necessary for the correct calculation of the interaction of hair with light and shadows. For example, the refraction of light soft scattering through thin hair or natural glare from the sun. In addition, a bunch of lines related to the rendering of individual strands of hair. Their shading, volume and density texture maps, voxel collisions and the division of each strand into several segments. Hair system settings such as color, density, length, physics, shadows and level of detail. The use of groom meshes technology which allows allows you to create more realistic and detailed hair with advanced physics and interaction with the environment. Considering everything, it should look very similar to the hair technology from the Frostbite engine. All this suggests that the developers are trying to create the most realistic and alive characters. An advanced navigation system that can take into account various types of space, including water and air. Commands for pointing and creating navigation areas in water and air. It is possible that it is closely related to NPCs' behaviors in conditions of altered gravity. Dynamic day and night cycle. Many parameters are responsible for the direction and properties of lighting depending on the time of day. Parameters that allow you to adjust the wind in the game, changing its strength, direction, types, density, height, as well as the possibility of changing it depending on the time of day. Various settings and parameters of dynamic fog, including its type, interaction with particles and lighting. Parameters indicating the presence of water in the game and the ability to control its properties such as depth, density, flow, reflections, splashes, buoyancy, and resistance. The presence of a dynamic weather system that can change in real time, including rain and snow. Some systems were taken directly from games on Source 1, but adapted to the formats of the new engine and an improved grass rendering system. All these findings make it clear that Valve are investing a lot of effort and time to create huge and realistic locations, possibly with a hint of an open world. This is confirmed by the existence of a new, hyper-developed and realistic vehicle system. Many parameters describe the physical properties of vehicles such as mass, dimensions, friction coefficients, air resistance, suspension parameters, tires, engine and transmission. Variables that control the behavior of vehicles such as maximum speed, acceleration, braking, steering and gear shifting. Different classes and parameters hint that there may be several types of transport in the game with different characteristics and capabilities. 
visual effects such as smoke from tires and reflections in water. Both players and NPCs can be in the transport. They occupy different roles of a driver and passenger. The passenger can interact with a separate weapon and some buttons possibly affecting the behavior of the transport. Another important technology that Valve is starting to integrate into Source 2 is support for meshlets. At the moment, they are used only when compiling maps and help to call or divide already compiled environments into a bunch of different triangles. This is necessary to optimize rendering of geometric detail. In the future, they may add support for dynamic meshlets. Simply put, mesh shading is an analog of nanites from Unreal Engine 5, but from NVIDIA. The use of these developments helps to process thousands of high polygonal objects literally in fractions of a second. Thanks to it, Valve will be able to raise the standard of graphics in their games to a new, photorealistic level without actual loss in performance. You can read more about this on the official NVIDIA blog post, and if you want to try out something with meshlets, you can register on the developer's website and download a demo called Asteroids. We should also mention the appearance of a separate protobuf for HLX, which confirms the existence of yet another separate project the appearance of HLX in the config for Bug Reporter. Roughly speaking, this is something that helps track errors in the software. As said, HLX is listed as a separate product and this appearance may indicate that the game has been moved to a closed testing stage. The leak of CSGO in the Source 2 bug reporter appeared three years before the announcement of Counter-Strike 2. It is important to note that testing is the most dangerous stage for Valve games. At this stage, a huge number of games were canned. So let's hope that HLX will survive this meat grinder. Surprisingly, we found an interesting icon in CS2 that had a hound eye touching grass. This icon is being used by an entity in Hammer while you are creating a new location. Based on the name, the entity seems to be responsible for changing certain behavior of an NPC. If we zoom out the icon just enough, it almost looks like a full 3D render. Last time this fella appeared was in Half-Life 1. But this render looks as if it's a model from Half-Life Alex. What's more interesting is that around a year ago, there was another icon that leaked in CS2 called AI Goal Siege, which acts as a goal or a point which NPC PCs must capture. We may assume that the icon with the hound eye also has something to do with the same project. Again, as I've said before, we'll be speculating regarding the future plot in the next video. However, looking through all of the findings, we can assume that Valve's desire right now is to create a more elaborate and open world setting with smart NPCs, cool vehicles, and brand new gravity mechanics and it seems like a big part of this game will have to do with Zen. According to Gabe himself, his last thoughts before the deathbed will be about all the regrets of how almost all locations from Zen had to be cut out of the first Half-Life. In another interview, Robin Walker mentioned the existence of a narrative plot hole in which players are stuck after the release of Half-Life Alex, and developers are going to fix this in the future. The theory that the plot could be revolving around the Zen dimension makes sense, since in the first Half-Life we were clearly told that even before the Cascade Resonance, Black Mesa was already sending scientists to Zen. From the events of the second game, we know that the Vortigaunts are the only force capable of restraining the mysterious G-Man. In the HLA finale, Alex uses the force that is sucked out of the imprisoned Vortigaunts with the help of which they power the Dyson Sphere and imprison G-Man. And I feel like the mystery of Zen and all the secrets of the Vortigaunts being unraveled will become one of the main plot twists of this game. I have been collecting all the information bit by bit for more than three years, and tomorrow I am leaving for a few days for my birthday. So appreciate my efforts with a like, subscription, send this video to your friends, and leave a jellyfish emoji in the comments if you've watched until